the world. Subscribe now to the Hot 97 YouTube channel. It's Ebro in the morning with Laura Stiles and Rosenberg. Ebro, Laura, and Rosenberg have found the icon, the legend himself, Ralph McDaniels of the Video Music Box. Woo! What's going on, sir? Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to be here. <laughs> Yo, man. I remember, Ralph, I remember before you digitized all of your work. I remember when I re, I remember the years of you converting those old beta tapes and all of those all those tapes you had in storage just to get it ready for this moment in time, man. There is there a Showtime go. documentary. Shout to Mass Appeal. Shout to Nas and everybody over there uh, on our brother R Uncle Ralph, man. It just dropped on Friday, right, Ralph? Yes, yes. Just dropped on on Showtime on Friday. Yes. Um, tell it. Tell us about the journey to this point um because i you know a lot of, you were capturing video and creating music videos um at a time when when hip-hop was just in its beginning stages or its earlier stages and and did you ever think about this time did you have this in your sights back then um yeah you know i did it's funny because you know i can look at old interviews that i did and i said somebody's going to want to look at this 30 years from now, 40 years from now, and here we are. Yeah. And so I think that I realized that video and visuals was important. I come up in a time, you know, when I started the show, when people used to run home to watch music videos, like that was a big thing. Like Michael Jackson set off this, this incre incredible craze to want to watch videos, and then hip hop came in and it just took off from there. Where, what, where did you, who did you talk to uh, and pitch for the original video music box. Like, what was the pitch? What was the whole idea? Um, the idea was to tell the story of, of a, a time when when people used to watch music videos, you know, on TV. You know, like, people don't even watch TV anymore. YouTube and other streaming networks have took over. And, you know, now, you know, you can watch it on demand whenever you want to watch it. But back then, you know, I wanted to tell a story like it was so important to to get home at a certain time, to make sure that you you recorded it on these tapes, cassette tapes called VHS, these videotapes, and Giant you know, made tapes. sure that you got it. Because if you didn't, you couldn't go back to school the next day and talk about the the the, the new Rakim video or the new Run DMC video that was out, you know, because you missed it and you feel like you wasn't part of the conversation. Well, and that's the, but that the documentary covers those things. But I, I mean, even and, you know, for people that are going to watch a documentary and if you haven't, because I'm assuming there's people who are watching this conversation right now that may have just heard about you. Like yes. they're just hearing about this moment. I, I mean, the original public television show when you walked in and said, I want to do this thing. Oh, yeah. Nobody got it. Nobody got it. It was it was a uh, um, nobody understood what I was talking about, you know, because it didn't exist. And anytime something doesn't exist, people just look at you like, you know, like we need to have we need to see it, you know. And, you know, they were like, nah, we don't understand. Why would people watch this? You know, I just saw it, you know, and I was I was a, a fan of anything music on TV. So if I watched Soul Train or if I watched Dick Clark back in the days or whatever was on TV, and there was a, a, a black artist on there or a hip hop artist on there, I'd be so happy because we didn't see that on TV back then. Mm. And so I said, you know, there's got to be a place for people to watch this on a regular basis. We didn't have cable in New York, and I think most of the country didn't have cable. So there might have been other things happening, but nobody saw it. And I wanted to create somewhere where people like myself who loved music, who loved to watch people perform, could watch, um, you know, these music videos or interviews or whatever it was on TV, but nobody got it at first. And it wasn't until this show called New York Hot Tracks came on that people got it. And then they said, oh, this is what Ralph is talking about. <laughs> so New York Hot Tracks became like a, almost like a proof of concept for me. And then two months later, we came on. Now, how long, Ralph, did it ever become, to be frank, like a remotely lucrative business for you or was this always a passion project for you yeah it was always a passion project um we were on a pbs station local but we were in all the households that abc and nbc and cbs and all the networks were at the time you know this is before cable so there's only like maybe 12 channels but we were in those homes so we knew that we had access to these people 
and that we could get to people and people would see it. Um, we started, I tell in the documentary, like we started figuring out we could give parties and that's how we could make money. <laughs> and so we were, <laughs> right. you know, people would hire me to come to their party and give me like, you know, $200. And then they would walk away with, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars And I said, wait a minute, how about if we give the party and we start doing it and we charge the money. And that's what we figured out. We can make a couple of dollars doing it like that. I w that first, um, let's talk about the equipment and showing up to places to do interviews, right? At a time when nobody had a camera, Ralph McDaniels was backstage at a club, at with a video camera. shoot with yep. him and his squad with the camera and the mic. Um, yeah. That first time you showed up with a camera and a microphone, do you remember? Yeah, yeah. People thought that it was the news that something had happened, like somebody got shot or something. They were like, "What? what why is there a camera crew here? <laughs> you know, like oh this doesn't God. normally happen. <laughs> you know, it looks like a news camera because back then we had big cameras with a big light and it lit the whole place up. And, you know, I was uh, sitting watching it with this young guy the other day. And he's like, wow, all these parties were in these basements. And that's the way he perceived it. It looked like we were in basements. And I was like, what do you mean basements? I said, that was a club. And he's like, but it all looks like basements. And I, so, But that's where hip hop could get a shot. You know, most of the clubs didn't want us to do hip hop parties. You know, they didn't want, you know, they didn't want that element, you know, they would say in their club. They and still don't, Robert. In they club. still running that same drag today. <laughs> <laughs> Ralph, um... Of all the incredible events that you were the only person there with a camera, are there, what are the ones, for people who are unfamiliar and they're thinking about watching this documentary, what are some of the iconic moments that you were there with the camera as the as the media outlet to, co to cover it? I always remember um, it was my birthday and there was this club called Exit. And, and, and Jay-Z came and Biggie hosted it, yep. which is hard to believe you know that biggie's hosting your party and jay and they, and they both get on stage and go back and forth and do um junior mafia's get money together you know um that was so iconic to me you know and it was just like one of those perfect parties the vibe was beautiful and um and the visuals of it is you know i'm glad we captured it i i of course always think about the summer jam the interview with Rockefeller after the Michael Jackson moment. Now, the Michael Jackson moment, there's barely any footage of. It's like a shot of the big screen. What do you remember, though, about that zone, that that post-interview that you did with Jay and Dame and everyone after the Michael Jackson Summer Jam moment? You, you know what's crazy is that it didn't make it to the doc, but I did interview Jay, and I asked him about that because I've never – had the moment to ask him, like, why didn't you talk? And um, and it didn't make it to the doc, you know, but we're going to put it up so he can really t say in his own words, that's what I said, in your yes. own words, what really happened there? But what happened from my perspective was, you know, it was the greatest moment. You know, Jay's on stage, Michael Jackson comes here, the crowd goes crazy. You know, it's like an accomplishment. And then we go backstage and Jay was like, give me a second, you know, and I was like, all right, you know, and then it was like an hour went by. And then he's like, give me a second. And two hours went by, I said, Jay, I got to go home. And so, you know, he said, all right, let's do it. But I'm not going to do the interview. I'm not going to talk. Let everybody else talk. And I was like, are you kidding me right now? <clears throat> Excuse me. Are you kidding me? And he was like, it's all right. Let everybody else talk. And I was so pissed off with him. But I've been connected to that footage for so long that, you know, it's crazy. You never know what moments you're going to be connected to. Um, and, and that moment was so special for him. And I'm going to post it up soon. I want to let the documentary breathe a little bit, but some of those interviews that didn't make it to the doc, we're going to take, especially that one, because Jay in his own words says exactly what happened that night. <laughs> I mean, that was probably where he came up with the idea for what more can I say? Shit. Right. I ain't got nothing else to shit. I just brought Michael Jackson out. Y'all want me to talk? What the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Mass yeah, yeah, yeah. He, did a. I'll tell you this. He said he was on a high, and he was like, he was so. Um, it was so uh, such an accomplishment that he just was like, I, I don't know, you know, that's that much. Yeah. Ralph, I saw you at uh, at the Mass Appeal pop up. They did an incredible pop up that's open to the public for the next couple of weeks, where they honor the documentaries that are coming out. 
And they, you guys, they recreated like a backstage, like an old school backstage. So when you go in, it's like you get handed a VIP badge. And it's like if you were him, like backstage trying to interview artists. But there were some beautiful pictures on the walls. This is a picture of yeah. you uh, interviewing Aliyah. And I just wanted you to tell me a little bit about that moment when, and when you were, you know, backstage and the conversations you guys used to have. Yeah, Aliyah... Um I worked with Aliyah, my partner and I, Lionel Martin, a.k.a. the in the documentary kid, he's entry. Um, we had done her first video back and forth. And um, and so we every time she would come to New York, she would just like, yo, Ralph, you know, I'm going to be in New York. Where, we, where, where you guys going to be at? And that particular uh, interview that's in the doc is at the, um, the Apollo. And that was the first time she had performed in New York. And it was also her 16th birthday. And, um, and so there was this rumors kind of rumbling around about her and R. Kelly. And, you know, and she said, I said, look, I want to ask you about it. She says, no problem. And so she talks about it in the documentary. And she was just, you know, like just a great spirit from, you know, a young person. And th there's all this footage that I have of Aaliyah. Like, that's a documentary by itself. Of Aaliyah backstage at the Apollo and just, you know, just her spirit and, you know, and then getting out on stage. And Apollo is a tough crowd. And she killed it that night. Were there any artists that were hesitant to have you around? Like they didn't want to get documented? They didn't want the camera all <laughs> up in their face? Um, Not really. I think that for me, I just kind of like hung around. It wasn't like I showed up and was like, okay, we're going to do the interview. You know, like we hung at the parties and, you know, we hung at the events and, you know, and I would just kind of smoothly ease <laughs> up with the camera and say, hey, let's talk a little bit. And then the artist would be like, okay. You know, it wasn't like formal. Like, I remember 50 Cent said to me, he said, doing video music box is like, it's it's easy. We It's like talking to a friend of his or talking in the, in the hood. You know, he says when he has to do more corporate stuff, he has to really be aware of what he's going to say. He has to think about it, you know. He said, but video music box is like natural to him. He says he, it's like he's watching it on TV and it's and it's it's smooth and and I tried to make that part of it, you know, in my presentation of video music box on TV. Like, let's not make it too formal. Let's make it like we're here, we hang out. I'm your friend, and, you know. And it, it just came off. It came off like that. What um, what percentage do you think of the stuff that you have was looked at for this film? Like, how many? What percentage of the tapes that you have, the endless tapes that you have, were were actually gone through? A, a very small amount. We just, you know, because we did this doc in six months, which is unheard of. You know, it was pandemic. Um, it was, you know, showtime schedule of getting it out because with the pandemic, a lot of the scheduling was off for production, you know, and so things are getting out and they were like, OK, we got to get it out December 3rd and this is it. And we were like, we're not finished yet. And so we we just got a chance to just kind of like go to some of the highlights and other parts that help tell the story and so there's so much stuff like i have twenty thousand hours of just interviews and performances and just stuff you know and we didn't touch it at all we didn't really get deep into it there's so many things that i was like no we have to have this in and we're like we don't have the time you know like i tell people this could have went on for three hours but you know it was like Showtime was like, well, you know, let's try it out in 90 minutes. Let's see how it goes. Is there is there one video? I know this has to be true. You because I know it's true of me, and I have a a, a, a a tiny millionth of what you have. Is there any content that you know you did, but you haven't been able to find it for years, and it drives you crazy? Yes, yes. What is yes? It? There's a performance of 50 Cent at Club Speed in New York, mm. and and like he comes out like and is pouring Hennessy on his on his head, and like I remember it visually, and the crowd was going crazy, you know, and and then he he you know I don't remember what song he came out on, but the visuals of that was incredible. In fact, there was a a rep there from the record company. It was like Ralph, don't play that. It just looks crazy. You know, he looks like he's an alcoholic or something. And I was like. I don't, is that really Hennessy in there? You know, because he always say, I don't drink, you know? So that footage, I haven't been able to find. I'm looking for it. Your 50 will put on a show, though. He'll put right. on a good show. And, that's, and that's, 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 show. that's the thing. He he understood that part, that Hennessy, club, late night, hip-hop, this is going to look hot Let's right Let's go here. crazy. <laughs> 
Yo, Uncle Ralph, man, I'm so I'm so happy to see you getting your flowers. I know you work so hard for this moment. And often I think about when I see people, you know, talking about what you did for hip hop, you know, I, I think it kind of gets glossed over also what you sacrificed for hip hop, right? Like your personal life, your personal time. I mean, you were everywhere that that hip hop was happening. Um, I'd love to hear from you on on that. I mean, you know, you have a family, you're married, you know, Queens native. Uh, you give back to the community like you've given so much. Um, how was the balance for that? How talk about some of those tough times, those fi- not only financially tough, but even just emotionally tough. Yeah, it was tough. You know, um, I mean, we talk about in the in the documentary when um, Giuliani, Mayor Giuliani at the time in New York sold the. Um, the the station and you know i was so used to doing it you know that i was like they're not gonna sell the station and then all of a sudden it was like okay that's it today's the last day it's off and we were like you know in full steam at that time you know doing a bunch of events you know i had events booked for months and i was like how am i gonna deal with this you know and but emotionally it's it's like it's tough because you you've been doing something for so long and and I didn't know what to do. Like I was really lost. I mean, I was doing other things. I was directing videos and stuff, but nothing was like video music box. Like that was connected to the people every day. You know, everything I do was, you know, yo, Ralph, what party you gonna be at this week? Oh, yo, I saw you last night. Oh, you know, everything was every day was 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 about that. And and that was a tough time because I just didn't know what to do. And I just stayed in the house for like like a month and just was like, I don't want nobody to ask me nothing. I don't want to talk about it. I don't have the answer. I don't know what to do. And um, and I say that, you know, I didn't want to go to BET. I didn't want to go to MTV because I felt like they would be like, oh, good. Finally, Video Music Box is over. This guy's been here forever. You know, and I, I just had this whole thing that I built up in my head and my pride got in my way. And I, and I just didn't know. I just stayed home and I was like, I'm not going to talk to nobody. And, you know, and it probably wasn't like that. It was probably all in my head. But, um, you know, I had to get through that moment and, and go like, OK, you know, put your, you know, put your hat on, put your put your hoodie on. Let's get out here and let's 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 get let's get it popping again. And that was a tough time, even for my, my wife was like, you know, like, OK, you know, you, you're going to be fine. You know, and I'm like, well, how, how could they possibly sell this station? <laughs> But that's a, it's an, I'm sure it, it probably uh, sharpened you in ways, too, because now fast forward this content that you've uh, been capturing and the videos you've directed. This is, you know, now you have these archives, you have this these pieces of history that now you're in some ways you're the uh, uh, what is it? The the a sommelier, if you will, or a, a curator of almost like a museum, a visual museum of hip hop. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's. um the pandemic also helped that, you know, because I knew in my head, you know, and I've I've licensed content to other documentaries like um, uh, Beach Rhymes in Life. I sat with Michael, Michael Rappaport on, and gave him some incredible footage of Tribe Called Quest. Um, the, the Nas Illmatic documentary, I gave them some incredible footage for that. You know, so I knew that I, we had great footage of iconic moments in hip hop. But this was like my story now. It's like I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about me. And so that really, you know, made me kind of like sit down during the pandemic and look for that, you know, and just really bring all of those notes. And there's so much information, you know, that's in these 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 tapes, not just the artists, but what the artists were wearing, the clubs they were at, the city they were in, um, what songs were playing, what dances people were doing, what, you know, you know, just all of this information. So I have this incredible girl who just documents and she's young so she's not looking at it from old school eyes like me she's looking at it from 2021 eyes and saying oh no this is here this is you this is popping right now you know you need to have all this and this needs to be available so that you know a young you know a college student can see it and that's why we started the video music box collection so that it can be available to colleges and universities and museums and libraries that i work with so that people can get access to it and in a nonprofit sense and go into those institutions and look at it. There it is. His name is Ralph McDaniels. Yo, were you the original uncle? Were you the original hip hop uncle? I feel like he is. 
Because a I'm lot of people sh- throw around that unk term these days. Unk this and yo, that's unk and uncle. Yo, I'm a, and we love Snoop Dogg. But uh, you know, you your activity in in the culture predates Snoop Dogg. Were you the original hip hop uncle even before well, Uncle Lou? I think Lou? that me Red Uncle Red, big up to Cool DJ Red Alert, the legend, and um and Uncle Luke were the first three. Now, I don't is. know which one came first, but Red Alert is the one who called first started calling me Uncle Rob. Really? That's, that's crazy. And you got, yeah, that's I did not know that. All right. Hey, that's listen, go watch this doc. Learn the history. It's on Showtime right now. Shouts to Nas and Matt Peel. We appreciate you, Ralph. Yeah, and, and Ralph, you. we Thank love you so you. much. Yeah, and, and it sounds like there's going to be more. So this is kind of like the first installment, it sounds like, another proof of concept. Yes, yes. More video, more audio, um, you know, just incredible content that's available. And, and we're going to put some out and, you know, hopefully Showtime lets us get some more or somewhere, somebody lets us get some more time. We hope so. Uncle Ralph McDaniels, go look for it. We love you, sir. Thanks, Ralph. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Take care, man. Later. Peace.